Hey, y'all, this is Eric from Alabama. And I'm Jerry in Boston. We want to welcome our listeners from the United States and around the world. It's another Sunday podcast. And a good day to you, my friend, Eric. And a good day to you, my friend, Jerry. How are you doing, Jerry? I am better than I deserve. How are you doing? About the same. Yep. About the same. Good to hear. Good to hear. How are things up in Boston? Things couldn't be better. Weather is getting really good. We just had an interesting week of weather here in Boston. We had uh, a little snow, a little slush, a lot of rain, cold, and now we're heading into the 60s and the 70s again. So, like we say, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Yeah, that's still pretty, well, 60s and 70s, I know that's nice for y'all, but that's pretty pretty chilly down here. But we're uh, we're in full-fledged spring spring mode over here in Alabama, so... Everything's turning green, and all the bugs and the animals are coming out. So, in fact, uh, my neighbor, um, as a practical joke, just laid a a snake skin in front of my front door. <laughs> oh, nice guy! <laughs> is that, now, is that is that to make you think there's snakes in your house? Uh yeah, probably. Are you sure it was a practical joke? Yes, yeah, I am. Oh, that's that's that that's the kind of friend you need, right? That lay is in the, yeah. laying the skins. Yeah. You know, I I um I did something interesting. I started doing this thing this week with people because you know, going back to that whole thing with the regiment, I won't get into all that, but uh, people, you know, people have been asking, "Hey, how are you doing on this on this regiment thing?" Right? So, you know how people refer to the bathroom as the John. Yeah. Well, I decided I'm going to change it, and I'm going to call it Jim instead of John. Right? That way, I can tell people that I go to the gym. <laughs> and now that I'm doing the you know the transportation driving people around again, you know the the Uber thing, and then I do Lyft. So people say, hey, what did you do today? And I said, well, I said, I, I lift, I went, I went lifting and I went to the John, a gym three times today. So. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You can say I got up this morning, went, to, went straight to the gym and got a good workout. And in. then, and then I went, and then I went <laughs> lifting. So everybody thinks I'm really into this exercise thing. So and then hey, whatever, whatever they they want to believe. On the last uh, episode, uh, we talked about you. Uh, we're heading off to a uh, recital. One of your students, uh, one of your drum t uh, students, uh, that you had been teaching was in a recital. How did that go? Uh, it went well. It went well. Um, my old drum student that I went to go see, he did really well. I can tell he's. Uh, he's getting better and building off of off of his skills and his knowledge and he was much you know looser um his playing that's a good thing you know when you when you play drums you don't want to be all stiff you want to be relaxed and and kind of um be off the cuff in some situations and he was able to do that pretty well and he was super comfortable with it that's good and i and um, i don't recall if you mentioned how how old is this young man Oh, I think he's sixteen, seventeen. Okay, cool. So, well, good. I'm glad to. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. I'm not surprised. Not surprised if he has you as a teacher and uh, that he's doing well. So, well, I bet you it's Benny's teaching that. <laughs> Combination so. of both. Combination of both. So enough about you and I just talking. This we actually have a guest on this episode this week, a very special guest. Uh, some folks might remember uh, back in January we did a show. Um, on uh, candle pin bowling with a very special guest uh, by the name of Tom Giordano. 
Well, our guest today is named Tom Giordano, and it's not a coincidence. It's not the same guy, but it is his son, and he is, uh, he is here to talk to us about home brewing, which I think is going to be a really interesting show here for our listeners. Anybody that uh, has ever thought about it, or maybe you do it, or know somebody that does it, um, he's got some interesting um, facts and stories to share about about the home brewing. And this is just another example we've talked about in previous episodes of how the pandemic has brought out these different types of things, like this podcast. The pandemic, the pandemic, this podcast was spawned out of the out of the uh, uh, the pandemic. We wouldn't have ever done this, most likely, unless we were always just stuck in the house a year ago. Well, same kind of a thing here with um, with the home brewing. So, Tom uh, Giordano is his name. He is actually a research scientist in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's what he does full-time. Very smart guy. And he's going to join us to talk about home brewing. So what do you say we bring him on? And uh, welcome to the show, Tom Giordano. Hey, guys. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited uh, to be on the podcast. We appreciate you joining us. How how are you? Absolutely, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, you know, I was I was listening to you guys talk a little bit about the weather. I'm uh, very excited to uh, have some of the nicer weather here in uh, in Cambridge and uh, start to to be able to be outside and and enjoy some of that. So, um, looking forward to it. Well, we're um, we're happy to have you, and a very interesting topic. And we, um, uh, Tom, is a listener of the show as well, and thought, hey, he answered our call. Uh, we've called out if you have something interesting to talk about or know somebody. Well, this is how Tom has has joined us here. So why don't we just dive right into the topic of home brewing and from a very kind of a high level, what is what is home brewing? Is it as simple as what it sounds? Absolutely, yeah. No, it's uh, it's you know, it's pretty well defined uh, in 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 the term home brewing, right? So, uh, you know, first, Jerry, I think you you nailed it, right? You hit it on the head, right? This is something um, that I've always been interested in, and um, and you know, I enjoy beer, I enjoy drinking beer, um, but home brewing for me was something that really came. Um, you know, started with the, with the pandemic, right. With, with, uh, being home and looking for a new hobby. Um, I was actually, you know, our being a research scientist, our lab, you know, had, had shut down, um, a little bit, uh, more than a year ago. Right. So it was back in February, March last year. And, and I was home, you know, from, you know, basically March to, to June of, of last year, you know, I had always wanted to, to homebrew. I'd always wanted to do it. And it just seemed like the perfect uh, opportunity to, to try to, you know, just dive in head first to it. Um, and exactly to your point, it's, it's, it's brewing at home uh, for lack of a better, for lack of a better term. So you've only been doing this for about a year or so. Yeah. So yeah, that's, you know, Eric, that's, that's a great question. I, so to maybe rewind a little bit, you know, I, dabbled in a little bit of home brewing in college so I went to uh, I went to university uh, up in Vermont up in Burlington Vermont at the University of Vermont which is a um, you know the state of Vermont is uh, very big into beer brewing it's uh, has a lot of really really great breweries a lot of you know world-renowned breweries uh, and it has a lot of them I think per capita it has the most the most breweries for any state in or uh, in the United States, and and maybe the um, you know mileage in the world, right? It just has a lot of, a lot of breweries. So this was something that you know initially my roommates and I, I think you know I think we tried it once or twice uh, to varying degrees of success. Um, I don't think it's anything. It, it, it we like to joke that it passed the blindness test, right? So um, it was something that you could <laughs> you could drink and you know and not you not go completely blind with. But it was nothing that we would ever you know share or uh, or you know try to try to do again. Um, and that was many many years ago. And it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't until last year. It was literally March, April of last year that I, I just, you know, 
just wanted to get into it. Like I said, you know, I, I enjoy a lot of beer from a lot of different breweries here in Massachusetts, from around the country, around the world. And it was something that I always, you know, being a research scientist, it was something that I always thought I could potentially get into and try to tinker or try to tweak or just add my own kind of, you know, flavor uh, to. Um, and it was something that I really wanted to research and read about and get into. And so that's actually, you know, that's one of the first things that I did, right? Before I got into it and I actually started doing it, I actually just read a lot about it, right? I read online. Uh, there's a lot of good resources online. I actually read a lot of books, right? So I actually bought, you know, um, I have three or four you know, homebrew books that I read and just used them literally as research guides, went in with a highlighter and just started, you know, you know, bending pages here and there. If I saw something I liked circling things, highlighting things. And that's really where I started. How easy was it to get into it? Like finding the materials and I know they have, uh, I think you can buy like homebrew kits and stuff on the internet and all that. But I was wondering how easy is it to get into it and to, and to kind of perfect it to where you can get something really good. That's a great. Know? That's a great question. And and you actually you use a really good work that, word there when you said perfect it because I you know I per, I am in no way uh, perfecting what I'm doing and I, honestly I think you know beer brewing in general and you know whether you're a home brewer whether you're a craft brewery whether you're a you know major brewery like I think that is really driving a lot of the people who do it is is trying to perfect it but always you know maybe coming up a little bit short and then doing you know the next batch and the next batch and the next batch to just try to make it you know better and better right um as far as ex- yeah, it, just like an art, right? It's it's like it's like kind of like you know paint strokes and like kind of you know you know brushing over you know spots on the canvas, right? And it totally is like that, right? That it, um, so when I you know, so as far as accessibility, you know, uh, the internet is is king, right? So you could pretty much go online, you can pretty much Google anything you want, and you can find a recipe for any beer that you want to brew. So name your favorite beer, you could go online and you know and probably find you know, a recipe that someone tried to brew that beer, you know, almost like reverse engineering a beer, right? So you're sitting there drinking your favorite beer. You're thinking about what does this taste like? What is this? How does this feel? You know, what am I getting here? And they, you know, people, people go nuts. They'll go in and, and really try to, to figure out what the secret recipe is. Right. And they'll, you know, and they'll, and people will compare back and forth. Right. So there's a lot of online forums of saying, Hey, I tried to brew this. This is the recipe I used. And, you know, people come back and say, Oh, that's great. Did you try this? And no, I'm thinking it's this and all these things right so it is an ever evolving it's a it's a dialogue right it's kind of this you know online dialogue of people just really and it's a community right that's the other cool thing that i really enjoyed was seeing all these people who you know no and no one you know people are are pretty cool about it no one's you know saying hey your beer you know your beer sucks like you shouldn't be you know everyone's very supportive of one another right and they're you know they're trying to kind of push people you know push each other and say hey you know did you try this did you do that right so that was where i you know the first place i went then like i said I went online. There's a couple books that I really enjoy reading. Again, just, you know, coming from a science background, I find that having the material in front of me is always really good. Um, there's there's a book that I encourage, like, anyone who wants to get into home brewing. It's literally called How to Brew. And it's, it's called Everything You Need to Know uh, to Brew a Great Beer. And it's by this guy, John Palmer, who kind of became sort of the i don't want to say like the homebrew guru but he was a i think he had a, an engineering background or something or a science background or something like that and he was like i want to i want to write this book to basically distill everything you would need from literally going into a store or going online and buying the equipment everything you would need to get up and going all the way to you know the nuance of like, I want to brew this type of beer. What ingredients do I need? All these, you know, like, you know, talking about very, very scientific, very specific things. So he runs the gamut and you can, you can use it kind of as an encyclopedia. You can take it for as, as much or as little as you want and and kind of, you know, take as much information out of it as, as you feel you want to. Um, So that was the first kind of big resource that I used. And then there's this, uh, this guy, uh, Charlie Papazian, 
who wrote a book called The Complete Joy of Home Brewing. And he was sort of seen as the godfather of home brewing. He was living in Colorado. Um, he was this guy who like literally just took home brewing on. He was like, I'm going to do this. And pretty much he became, he started like enter. He, I think he started these competitions for home brewers. People could come and enter their beers into competitions and like, you know, and, and start, you know, comparing, you know, home brews and styles and all this stuff. And he was the one who really took it from being this kind of like, niche kind of thing into what's now you know there's 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 literally a a uh association of american home brewers which has about 1.2 million people right so he he was the one who kind of took it into that like big um that big scale so those are really the two books that i like had to get and really buy and then there's other ones like i love drinking ipa right so i bought a, a book um called um it's literally called IPA and it's everything that you would want to know about brewing an IPA. And it talks about the history of an IPA, which, you know, is great. That's, that's cool and everything, but it talks about, you know, how you would make different varieties and all these kind of things. So it's really just finding those resources. Um, and then, you know, finally the, the last piece of it is getting the equipment, right. And I'm fortunate. I live in Cambridge mass, which is, a pretty big, you know, neighborhood and, and city for like DIY kind of do it yourself people, a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs, a lot of people who, you know, build their own, you know, whatever they're, you know, people just doing their own thing. And we actually have two or three different home brew stores right in Cambridge. So one of the things I did was I walked in one day, they were super friendly, super helpful. And I was like, this is what I want to do. What do I need? Um, and exactly to your point, they were like, you could buy this kit and this gives you, you know, all the ingredients and the steps to make this kind, or you can kind of do it yourself and you can kind of, you know, start with a recipe and tweak it a little bit. And that's what I chose to do. I chose to kind of, kind of go, go at my own and, and, um, and try to, you know, like I said, I had a couple, you know, uh, a couple varieties of beer that I really enjoyed. And I was like, I want to try these. Um, and exactly to your point, the first couple batches, like they came out not not tasting that great, right? It was it was definitely a trial by fire, and sort of you know that's one of the beauties of this home brewing thing is you kind of have to you kind of have to do it to see what you're gonna get, and you don't know what you're gonna get until it's you know in the bottle and and ready to drink. So it's kind of a, a little bit nerve wracking, and it's a little um, it takes a lot of patience. So that that brings me to a question: what what makes a good tasting beer what what has to happen what do you have to do to make the, a good tasting beer sure um well you know jerry that's a little bit of a loaded question right so um you know i think exact uh a, you know a, a good beer uh is you know in the eye of the beholder right so the, you know, the beer that I brew that I really enjoy, I could give to, you know, I could give to you. And this has happened before where, I, where I've brewed a, a beer and then I've, you know, given it to someone and been like, hey, taste this, this awesome beer that I brewed. And they were like, is it supposed to taste like that? Like, is that, am I, am I, you know, missing something? Like, why does it taste like paint thinner? Like, you know what I mean? And so, <laughs> um, right. You know, and, and, and that, you know, I think it has to do with, um, you know, what you're into, right? Like what you like to drink. Right. So, a couple things. I think um, just from a very basic standpoint, like what makes a good beer, right? So again, you have to be very patient in, in home brewing, right? It takes, it actually takes, you know, a decent amount of time from the time you start a home brew to the time you can drink it, right? So one of the things that can totally, you know, mess up your home brew is if you are, if you get impatient and you try to bottle it too soon or you try to, you know, cut corners, right? That can lead to all sorts of things, right? your beer won't be carbonated enough, right? Like carbonation is one of the key things that people, um, you know, look for in a beer. Is it, is it, is it carbonated to a good amount? It doesn't want to be over carbonated or under carbonated, right? So you don't want to feel like you're drinking a soda pop, but you also don't want to feel like you're drinking, you know, flat, you know, water, right? So it has to kind of be somewhere in the middle there, right? That's one thing. Then it's all about the flavor profile, right? And that's where, you know, the flavor is going to come from the the hops that you use, right? And if you're using Amer, you know, like if you're using American hops, if you're using, you know, European hops, like all the, you know, if you're making a um, a lager versus an ale, right? So the type of yeast, all these different things are going to come in um, into play when you're talking about like a flavor profile, right? Um, and um, 
a, I don't want to say that a lot can go wrong, but again, it just, it, it can, if, if, and I've read horror stories of people trying to like, again, cut corners or like, you know, I want to, I thought my, my beer was done and, you know, I didn't, you know, give it enough time or I didn't check for this thing or that thing. And then, you know, they are bottling beer and then they're just getting kind of a, like a, you know, it's basically just like bad tasting water. Right. So, um, that's where it comes in, you know, the kind of like the scientific approach, at least that I take, um, comes into it a lot, right? So you can do a lot of like, you know, analysis, you can apply like a lot of metrics and stuff. You can look for things like, you know, there's things called the uh, gravity, right? So the gravity of the beer is going to be like how much of that alcohol has actually been dissolved into the beer and how much is left over, right? And that will play a whole you know, um, component into the taste and the, the feel and the flavor profile of it, right? It can, um, you know, things like measuring the alcohol content, right? So all these kind of things, well, you know, if you are, if you like drinking light beers and I give you a beer that's, you know, you know, a 10% you know, alcohol by volume, right. That's not going to, not necessarily going to taste good to you. Right. So there's all these sort of different nuance that come into what makes a, what makes you like a beer, what makes Eric like a beer, what makes me like a beer, what makes my dad like a beer, you know, what, like all these kind of things. So. And that's very interesting. I enjoy beer and enjoy drinking beer and all the different varieties fascinate me. And it's just countless. I mean, it's really like, you know, I mean, whatever you want to do, you know, uh, the the canvas is blank when it comes to making beer. You can do whatever you want, like right? that it's, to almost, me. it's endless, and, and, you know, sometimes it's actually overwhelming, right? I mean, there's, you, you know, and even just, you know, more and more you go to a, a bar or restaurant, you see these growing beer, you know, list of beer menus, and it's just, you know, hun- you know, you go to a bar, we have a hundred different beers on tap. Well, how do I, how would I even start with that? Right. Like, you know, where would I, where would I even go? Um, and that's exactly the approach that I took. Right. I, so I, I, when I started home brewing, I took, I took, you know, kind of two different, two different approaches. One, again, I drink a lot of IPAs. Um, that's sort of the, it's probably the most, um, you, you know, it's the, the, the largest variety of beer in the Northeast of, you know, of the United States, right? Like New England in particular has a lot of like IPA, you know, IPAs. Um, a lot of the breweries are brewing a lot of IPAs also like the West coast, California, right? Like that's where you get like, you know, a lot of, you know, what we call West coast IPAs. That was one of the first beers that really like, took over the beer, like the craft beer scene, right? It was like these super hoppy, like, you know, really floral, like very, like, you know, you could just smell it, right? Like there was a lot of hops in there, right? So IPAs were sort of like one of the things I was like, if I can brew an IPA, that's going to check the box to say that I can actually get my home brew like system up and running, right? That was kind of like the checks and balances for me. And, um, and they're pretty, I don't want to say that they're easy to brew. They're easy, they're easy to brew. They're hard to make very good, right? So you can make like a entry level IPA pretty easily. Will it be the, you know, knock your socks off, like next level, like IPA, like it probably not, but it can at least tell you if you're doing it right. So that was the first one that I really wanted to brew. And like I said, you know, at the beginning, like the first one I brewed, it was not, it was nothing remarkable. I kind of was like, okay, it tastes like beer. It's, you know, it's got, it's carbonated, it's fizzy. Like I said, it doesn't make me want to throw up. Like it's whatever. I, I brewed beer. I checked the box and I said, okay, I can, I can do it. The second one I came back and I was like, I'm going to try to like tweak a couple things, like, you know, add some different ingredients, kind of try to make something that I was more interested in and like kind of, you know, and that came out actually pretty good. I was pretty, pretty happy with that. And like, it was cool. Um, so the IPA thing was, was like, that was a variety that was pretty, low like a low bar as far as entry into home brewing and i think that's what you'll find across the board the second thing like the second thing i wanted to brew was a lager because like lager beers right are pretty ubiquitous like across the united states right like that's your like for better or worse right that's like your you know your budweiser your miller light like a pilsner lager all these very light beers right and um those actually those beers actually have a very like storied history in um in like western europe right in like a pilsner is brewed was originally brewed in in the czech republic because of and it was called a pilsner because 
it, the water source for this beer was coming from the town of Pilsen. And it, they found that the mineral content of this water was so unique to this town that it was making really, really good beer. And this flavor of beer was just like really, really, you know, really beautiful. So Jerry, back to your question, that's another whole thing, right? The, the water that you're putting in, right? That can lead to the taste of the beer, right? All these different things. Um, but a lager is actually, it's actually a little bit complicated to brew because of the you use a, a different kind of yeast than a, an ale yeast An ale yeast will just kind of like start fermenting and kind of expanding in, in your fermenter like super easily a, a lager yeast it has to like be set at a certain temperature it has to be uh like the temperature has to be lowered very specifically over the course of many hours and days and you have to check it and you have to that's when it became like a very scientific process to me but that to me was like if i can brew this lager beer like i will feel like accomplished or i i will feel like i i've added a different like nuance or something cool to like my home brewing you know kind of like resume or whatever and so that was the other variety so between those two varieties those were kind of the things that i was like i want to brew these right and like you know eric as i'm sure you know like you know there's a ton of varieties out there you might like stouts you might like you know Belgian style beers, like all these different, you know, types of beers and all those things, all those beers are going to be, you know, they're just going to take a different, you know, set of, you know, criteria and kind of, an, you know, different like parameters and all these things to, to brew. So it's, it's all what you want, you know, what you want to do. Yeah. And that's, what's amazing is that these different types, you know, like with the ale, there's the different type of yeast with the lager, there's a different type of yeast that has to be more controlled, like you said, and everything. And it's super interesting. And uh, you'll have to forgive me. I am a history nerd. <laughs> but uh, but I'm very curious um, about kind of, uh, I know you're interested into IPAs. Um, and if memory serves me correctly, that stands for India Pale Ale. Um, and so... Uh, but what's the history behind IPA and what's the history a little bit behind home brewing? Like, I don't know, like even back, I know like Martin Luther, his, his wife brewed beer for their house, you know, or whatever kind of, but kind of what's some of the history behind brewing and, and particularly the, the history behind IPA. Yeah, no, I mean, right. So you, you know, brewing, like it goes back to, so brewing literally, you know, goes back to antiquity, right. It goes back as, as far as I think recorded, uh, you know, recorded history. And I don't think I, I don't think I shared the story with Jerry, but I'll, I'll share it here. So, there was a summer where I was living in Cambridge, UK, right? So that's where Cambridge University is. Um, my company at the time had an office there. So I was, I was over there for the summer. Um, and they also have a very robust uh, pub scene, right? So this is where Watson and Crick, when they discovered DNA, they went into the Eagle pub and they declared, they, they, got a, bought a round of drinks for everyone and they declared we've we've discovered you know the secret behind dna right and so right right there that can tell you how like you know that can tell you the social like impact of of beer and breweries and pubs and all these things right it's a very social kind of you know thing right and it's tied intimately into the surroundings yeah. right so um but also in cambridge there is uh, a museum called the british museum and i was there it's a beautiful museum um if you ever have a chance being a history buff eric if you ever have a chance to go over there it's 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 beautiful and it's a lot of you know very old relics um uh you know from you know the the united kingdom from scotland from you know that entire area it's it's a, it's a really cool place and wow i'm you know i'm going around i'm peeking around and all these things and just by happenstance you know i don't know if this says anything about you know my brain and where it goes but like i I came to this tiny little exhibit. It was a um, it was a uh, clay sculpture from you know one BC or some you know you know Mesopotamia back in you know or Egypt back way back when, and 
it was uh, um, it was almost like a diorama of um, all uh, of what a Mesopotamian household would look like. So it was um, making bread and, uh, you know, uh, raising the cattle and all these things. And then it, in the corner, it had these huge, it had these little jars, these little people kind of hovering over the jars. And it said um, brewing, I think it said brewing mead or brewing, you know, alcohol or something like that, right? And so they were clear, it wasn't wine, right? So that's that's a huge distinction, right? We all know like the, or, you know, I, I don't know, I, the, I, I feel like the history of wine goes deeper and, and further back, but um, it wasn't that they weren't they weren't fermenting grapes. They were actually making uh, an alcohol from grain and and yeast and and all these and all these different things and fermenting it and so like this goes back you know uh, uh, however long right to the to you know again early antiquity and as you're saying like you know martin luther like you know um if, if his wife was you know brewing beer and you know it goes back to you know you know what was that the 1500s or um you know however you know uh, you know, uh, however many years, right? And then, exactly to your point, the IPA. We know that the name IPA, uh, as it implies, like the India Pale Ale. The the whole idea was that um, the beer basically came over, right, um, to uh, I believe it was to Britain or the New World um, from you know India and Africa from these these. Um, um, the basically slave states that they were coming over, you know, to, to the, to, to the new world. And the whole idea was that they were brewing this style. They didn't know that it was called an India pale ale yet. Right. Cause they, you know, they hadn't named it, but they were brewing a style of beer that was so, it was so fortified that it could withstand the trip across, across the ocean. Right. And by the time it got to its destination on these long, you know, sea voyages, it was not going to be spoiled. Right. And so, and that had to do with the composition of the, you know, the yeast and the barley and the hops and all these things. And the, the stronger they made it, the, you know, they realized it could last longer and longer. Right. And at least that's my kind of like anecdotal understanding of how the IPA uh, started or, how, you know, why it was named that. And then, I, you know, going back into these, you know, catalogs, I think what people realized were the, the, all these varieties of hops from around the world could be used to, again, generate these different flavor profiles. And so some of the original, you know, um, IPAs were using some of these varieties that they used in these, these, um, these beers to last, you know, again, a long journey across the ocean and get to get to their final destination still intact and tasting, you know, somewhat reminiscent of, of beer, but that's, that's the history component of it, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's like, it goes back a lot longer than, you know, us, you know, being in, you know, wherever, you know, opening a home brew, you know, a craft beer or a brewery or a home brew somewhere like that. It's, it's, it's tied into a pretty deep, deep history. So go, going back to the flavor uh, discussion real quick here, when, when Eric came up here to Boston to visit, uh, we had gone to um, one of the local uh, breweries here, and they talked about the containers, can versus bottle, and you know, color of bottle in home brewing. How how important in not just the flavor, but in in keeping the keeping the beer fresh, I guess, um, until you until you consume it. Is is how how important is container? It's a really important thing to think about, right? And so I imagine, you know, if they were, if they were giving you that background, they were probably saying, right, like the difference between a brown or a green or a clear bottle, and you know, and then you know all these different things, right? So, in in my opinion, like the the two biggest, so the two biggest um, things that you want to control for, or the, like you know, the two biggest culprits that make a beer taste bad are oxygen and light and, and and i should say a third temperature right so there's three things right so you want to make sure that your beer right so a beer by nature is carbonated right so any oxygen that gets in there whether it's at you know the canning you know whether it's at the fermentation stage whether it's at the bottling canning kegging stage whether it's during from you know it's conditioning stage right you want to make sure that you're not getting oxygen or like 
you know, excess amounts of oxygen into your beer because any oxygen that you get in there is going to remove carbon. And so then you're essentially just, you're going to get a flat beer, right? And so you want to make sure, or, you know, any additional oxygen is going to just, it, oxygen, oxygenation is going to basically age that beer a lot quicker than it was intended to. And so when it gets to you, the consumer or whoever's drinking it, right, it's going to taste different than the brewer intended. So we, that's one thing. And even when I, you know, I read blogs of different breweries that I really enjoy and all these people, you know, like giving reviews and saying, Hey, you know, that, that batch of beer tasted really funky. Like, I wonder, you know, was it, was it oxygenated? Like, was there a weird thing, you know, happening, um, you know, with that. So, that's totally number one thing is just the amount of the different gases that get into your beer. You want carbon, you don't want oxygen. The other thing, totally to your point, Jerry, is, um, you know, the type of bottle, right? So not to get in like, and I'm not a, I'm, I'm in no way a physicist, so I'm not going to you know pretend to know about, you know, cosmic light rays and all this different stuff. But one thing we do know is that when um, the, basically the the color or permeability of the container of the beer right so if you have a brown bottle versus a green bottle versus a clear bottle and if a beer is exposed to you know direct light that 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 can that can definitely have an effect on it on a beer right it can it can potentially break it down sooner than again the brewer had the intention of breaking it down it can it can kind of add you know some different factors that were not the original intention of how that beer was supposed to be aged right so that that is totally a, a, another thing um and then finally like temperature right so temperature is always going to be a big component right like um and eric you know i don't or, or jerry like i don't know you know depending on what kind of beers you like to drink right there's a there's been a really big um kind of uptick in um in what's called like sour beers right so like you know fruit like beers with fruit in them or you know beers brewed with different yeasts that make it taste a little more sour to the to the palate as opposed to bitter right yeah. a lot of those yeah. beers need to be kept uh at cold temperatures because what can happen is if that beer is expo is kept at a higher temperature what what, what can what can potentially happen is those yeasts can actually reactivate um, if they get above a certain temperature, right? Yeast are, yeast uh, is an organism that is um, is uh, very sensitive to temperature. So at low temperatures, it, it remains kind of dormant and it kind of just hangs out, right? It, it kind of stays there. But once it gets above a certain temperature, it can kind of start to kick back up again. And what can happen is if that happens in a sour beer or like, you know, one of these like fruit beers, um, you know, that beer can either become over carbonated, it could, you could potentially explode, right? So you could have, you know, if it's in a vessel, the, it could, the pop could, t you know, the top can pop. Um, or it could just change the profile. Again, it could just change the profile of, of the beer, or how the beer was intended to be enjoyed by the brewer, right? So temperature is a huge, huge component. Is that where beer goes green? Because I've heard about that. Like if you leave it in the trunk of a car on a hot day or whatever, what's, What's the the truth on that's that? That's funny. Yeah, no. So green, and it's actually funny because that's one of the first like um, like kind of nomenclatures or things that I learned when when you're brewing a beer. People always talk about, you know, the beer tasted green, the beer was green, like, all, and I was like, what the heck? what is that? Like, I'm like, you know, what what is that all about? Um, so a beer being green is actually actually kind of refers to uh, a beer that was either. Um, bottled or kegged too early right so it wasn't allowed to go through its full fermentation process and full conditioning process right um and the reason it can taste green is it kind of has those notes of like like kind of earthy kind of taste it hasn't and so the yeast is in there to basically eat up all the sugar in the beer right so when we brew these beers there's a ton of sugar in there and you put the yeast in it it starts chomping through all these sugar molecules to basically start to convert those to ethyl alcohol right and so that's that's how our beer becomes alcoholic right if a beer's a beer is called green if it's if basically that process was stopped um inadvertently right so whether it was the temperature was too high or whether the um again it was bottled too soon right that will lead to what's called a green a green beer or if if when you are conditioning your beer you basically store it in you know a temperature controlled environment and let it just hang out for two three four weeks however long you know uh, the for the for a particular variety of beer you have to go a certain 
you know, you have to age it for a certain amount of time, but if you don't age it long enough, it will taste, it'll have that earthy taste, which, which brewers call green. The, the taste that I think you're like referring to, like that's, yeah, you know, and actually I don't know the term for that. Right. But it's, it's kind of that, it, like, that's almost like the skunked, right. Like when, when people say my beer was skunked or something like that. Right. Like that's almost if it's gone. Yeah too yeah. far the other end right so if i brew a beer you know if i gave you a beer today that i brewed last year you know as part of my home brew and i didn't and i stored it in the trunk of my car like you would taste that and you would be like this smells like you know funky stuff right it doesn't taste it doesn't taste good right and that has more to do with just the beer being you know improperly stored right like beer is for lack of a better term like beer is kind of like a living a living organism right it's kind of like you know it, it has a lot of like you know biology in there so if, you, if you're not storing it correctly like it's it's going to kind of go bad right and, you know what i what i found interesting on the tour that we took um a couple of years ago what completely surprised me i've always been under the impression that beer in a can tastes worse than beer in a bottle and they explained that actually canned beer is better tasting than a bottle beer and it and i and eric might remember the story but I, I thought it had something to do with with the the sunlight like you talked about earlier and, and the light but i found that to be i found that to be interesting because i think that was a question i threw up is what's better bottled or can and of course everyone's like bottle you know we don't want to taste the can and stuff and they explained all that stuff so um so this has been great uh, lots of information here. Very interest, interesting stuff that I learned more about <laughs> brewing ever, beer. Did you ever I, wanted to know? No, I, I find it interesting. I find it, you know, it's it's uh, you, you know, for me though, it's pop the top and 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 down and down the beer. So for for the listeners who might be interested in getting started in a home brew, you talked about various equipment and things and some books, and I'll get that back to that in just a second. What kind of cost range, if if you know, would it be? So if I wanted to be a home brewer, very first time, what am I looking at for? Am I looking at thousands of dollars? Am I looking at hundreds of dollars? This comes back to kind of like the beauty of home brewing, right? So you can you can kind of choose your own adventure, right? And that's kind of the like again, that's kind of one of the reasons that I got into it was because you can make it as complicated and spend as much as much money as you want. There are people I follow um, and I, I, I don't remember the exact name of the handle on Instagram, but uh, it's something like, like Brooklyn homebrew or something. And it's, it's basically a, a person who brews in their, you know, in their small apartment in Brooklyn and they're literally on a stovetop in their kitchen. They're brewing a, um, you know, it's like a gallon, you know, it's like they were making, you know, sauce or something in a, you know, in a gallon, um, you know, a, a gallon pot. Right. And, and they're making literally one, you know, one jug at a time. Right. And, and they're, you know, they're doing it from start to start to end. And they're, they're that's what they want to be doing. And they're pouring that out for their friends. Right. I know home brewers. I have a friend who, he has his entire garage, which is probably the square footage of, you know, the first floor of our apartment here in Cambridge. Uh, he has more space than, than we do, but his entire garage is outfitted with all sorts of homebrew equipment, right? He has everything. He has stuff on, on, you know, that he can control through his iPhone. So he can, on, in the middle of his day, he can go on and make sure the temperature is controlled and all this, and the fan is on and the exhaust pipe, pipe is working and this and that and all this stuff, right? That's the beauty of this, right, is you can make it as – you can spend as little money and, and make it as simple as you want, or you can go all out and, and make it as complicated as you want, right? For me, that was a huge – that was a huge kind of um, – like a huge distinction, right? So we have, you know, a limited amount of space here. Like I do my home brewing in our basement, right? So we have a finished basement. We have a tiny little nook that has a two burner stove and it has a little, um, it has a bar sink. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, you know, the two things that you absolutely need are you need, you need heat, whether it's a, you know, a, 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 um, a coil burner or a gas stove, like you need heat and you need water, right? So those are the two things. Um, and, you know, what I've done here in Cambridge is I generally brew what's called a six gallon batch or some people call it a five gallon batch. And that that's kind of like your entry level 
batch of beer, right? So Eric, as you were saying, like when you get one of those homebrew kits, right, it's probably going to be like a five or a six gallon batch. And essentially what that is, is you're brewing, you're starting out with um, like your base is essentially three gallons. It's on the a stove top and, you know, um, and you're starting it and then you're basically putting it into a six gallon carboy to, for, to ferment. Right. And so that's kind of the entry level like size of, of homebrew. Right. And then the other thing you need is, so you need a good pot, right. A good kettle, you know, um, you know, a good, um, good stock pot or a good, you know, kettle pot for your stove that is generally, like I said, anywhere between three and five gallons, you need some, you need a temperature, like, you know, some sort of like thermometer or basically a way to like, you know, understand, you know, what temperature you're at. A lot of the steps in home brewing are very particular to like, you know, add this at this temperature, add this at this temperature, get your, you know, get your boil down to this temperature, right? So everything's pretty, pretty controlled, right? Um, And then you just need a way to transfer whatever is in one container to the next. Right. And so the way that I've done that is I've set up like a bunch of like, you know, quick connect uh, tubing. Right. So I can go from one vessel to the other without having to like pick things up and, you know, be spilling stuff everywhere. I would say, you know, for like the home, the whole thing, like I got into it, you know, probably for a few hundred dollars, like, you know, with spending two to $300, I was able to basically brew, you know, pretty much get where I, where I am now. Like I know people have spent thousands of dollars and it's a big range from from a few dollars to a ton of dollars. And we just learned that you, you essentially have a still in your house. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) All right. Well, we won't give out his address for those authorities that might be listening. If he's doing it, if if he has a still in there. Finally, you mentioned earlier on um, a couple of books. If you want to just mention those really quick again, the name of the book and the author, and uh, for the folks that may want to go out there and uh, pick up those books. and Absolutely, yeah. So for me, it was uh, the first book was called How to Brew uh, by uh, John Palmer. And to me, again, that's like sort of the encyclopedia of home brewing. I use that for everything. I go back and forth and make notes and write everything in the, in the margins, and it's an awesome book. Um, and then uh, the second book that, you know, I really enjoyed was called the complete joy of home brewing by this guy, um, Charlie Papazian. Um, and again, that was sort of the, he was again, the kind of the godfather of, you know, home brewing and the one who kind of started the the culture a little bit. So if you got those two books, you know, you would be, you would be off to the races and you'd be, uh, you would become a home brewer in a very little time. Well, man, that was super informative. So that was awesome. Yeah, That's hopefully, cool. yeah. You know, I mean, um, you know, I I like this stuff a lot. It gets, you know, it's as Jerry mentioned, right? Like, you know, I'm a research scientist, and so this kind of gets into my wheelhouse as far as, you know, just tinkering and tweaking things. Um, and so, yeah, you know, if you ever, yeah, I would I would love to love to talk more, you know, off the record about, uh, you know, all of your guys, you know, favorite beers and all that kind of stuff. It's it's fun. Well, again, thanks for joining us and, and, and telling us the story. We'll definitely uh, have you back in a future episode. We can continue the conversation, and maybe if you discover a, a new flavor or you know, who knows, discover some completely different. Thank you very much. Very, very, very informative. Thank you guys for having me. This has been this has been super exciting. I've you know loved uh, loved talking about this stuff. All right, that's Tom Giordano. Everyone, he is the. Uh, the brewmaster, as we'll call him here on the on the show, with all the information that you need if you want to become a home brewer. And again, as I said before, Tom was a listener on the of the of the show and wanted to appear and and talk about uh, about home brewing, which you can do too if you have anything uh, that you're involved in or you're interested in or know somebody that might have some interesting hobbies or jobs or stories, you can reach out to us at it's another Sunday podcast at gmail.com. We'd love to have you on the show. Eric, now that was unbelievably interesting and informative to me. I don't know about Oh yeah, you. absolutely. Yeah, I mean I'm you know, I enjoy beer and drinking beer and trying different styles and types. Um but yeah that was that was super cool. I learned a lot. Yeah, great, uh, great episode, great guest. We'll definitely have to have him back and talk about, you know, as as he progresses with uh, home brewing and, like I said, maybe he maybe he'll discover a new flavor. 
All right. Well, that's going to end this episode of It's Another Sunday Podcast. We appreciate the listeners for listening, of course, and for sending your comments to us. If you're listening to us on YouTube, please click the subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified every time we release a new episode on YouTube every Sunday at 9 a.m. And if you're listening to us on Spotify or Stitcher or Apple Podcasts or any of those other streaming services, the episodes drop every Sunday at 8 a.m. We appreciate your participation. So with that said, I'm going to say Godspeed, Glenn, and Eric, final word to you. Roll with the changes. It's Another Sunday Podcast is produced by Eric and Jerry. Technical advisor, Tom Billadoo. Music composed and performed by Tom Blaze. Check out Tom's YouTube channel at Tom Blaze. That's going to do it for another edition of It's Another Sunday Podcast. Thanks for listening.